Okay, so this is the first <coughs> lecture in spectroscopy formally. So those of you who've watched the, I guess, 10 or 15 minute introduction lecture um, will know that I'm talking to an empty room. So I'm trying to recreate the lecture experience here as much as possible. Um, but I uh, hope you are all enjoying this course from wherever you're viewing it. And really, uh, in this course, I want to um, talk about when we get something like this. Let me just turn on my pointer here. This is a spectrum. And uh, we see the spectrum has lots of peaks on it. This particular peak, this particular spectrum, all the peaks are regularly spaced. Uh, there's a kind of a shape in the spectrum. We're getting a sense of increase in energy, increase in transition intensity and decrease again. And this course is about when you get a spectrum, how do you find out something with a molecule? All right, so as I mentioned in the sort of 10 minute preamble, um, this means we need to know the underlying theory. But what I'm interested in or what I want to share with you in this course is how do we find out structural information about the molecule? How do we use spectroscopy experimentally? So there are lots of textbooks in spectroscopy. Um, uh, Atkins is obviously the core Fizchem textbook. Uh, most of what we talk about will be in the chapters on rotational and vibrational spectroscopy. Um, at the moment, chapters 12 to 13, but you might have to shift that, that chapter hunt, depending on which edition you're looking at. Uh, the classic introduction um, text is Banwell and McNash, and it's, I'm only mentioning it now because it's a very useful textbook for third year. Um, uh, I'll just have a drawing, my general notation, and so on. Uh, from, from, that, from that book, that's a sort of standard uh, introduction to the electric spectroscopy textbook. And um, modern spectroscopy, which you'll probably find online, is a more advanced text, but if you want to dig into uh, stuff a little bit more deeply, uh, this, is, this is quite a good book. And again, chapters 5 to 7 relate to the three types of spectroscopy we'll be talking in our course. Um, so obviously, uh, spectroscopy is an essential tool for chemists. You've likely come across it already experimentally and certainly uh, in a lecture course in first year. And it's informed by our understanding of theory. Okay, so what we understand from theory we can bring to spectroscopy, but as I will hopefully say quite a lot, it allows us to relate this theory and observation. So we can use the theory to go, okay, that's what's happening. That's why I'm seeing the spacing there. But that's why that is that intensity. And this is what it tells me about the molecule I'm looking at. So obviously, spectroscopy as a topic uh, depends on who you talk to. It doesn't really sit in any formal section of chemistry because it covers everything. OK, there's organic spectroscopy, inorganic spectroscopy, physical spectroscopy, analytical spectroscopy. So obviously, it relates to all kinds of chemistry. So we can use it for looking at reaction rates, solid state interactions, photochemical interactions, so my own background as a photochemist, looking at interstellar compounds, astrochemistry, and so on. Uh, whatever your flavor of chemistry is, I'm afraid spectroscopy will be there uh, along, along by your side. So there's particular aims and outcomes in this course, but really I think the, the, the fundamental take-home message is the aim is to give you some sense of how useful spectroscopy is and how you can use it to really get some in-depth knowledge about molecules that we'll be studying. Okay, so in spectroscopy, the key word is transitions. So in the preamble, I mentioned that we're able to talk, we're able to describe energy levels, and energy levels are quantized. In spectroscopy, what we're interested in is the difference between those energy levels, what we call a transition. So a transition is essentially a movement of um, electrons from one energy level to another. And usually this is done by energizing the molecule, providing it with energy so that we get absorption, or allowing energy to be re to be dissipated from the molecule so that we get emission. So the kind, kind of transitions we will come across are, well, we mentioned that molecules can be described by what's called the potential energy curve in the, in the preamble lecture. So this potential energy curve will have several um, electronic level. So for example, from MO theory, you know that uh, molecular orbitals will be a series of molecular orbitals of increasing energy um, describing a diatomic molecule, for example. So that could be all of these lines here. And um, 
within each of those electronic energy levels, there will be lots of vibrational energy levels. And within each of those vibrational energy levels, there will be lots of rotational energy levels, and so on down the energy chain. And what this means, then, is we can, get, we can get three types of transition just in this very simple diagram. We can get a transition whereby an electron is moved from an occupied orbital. So if we think of our MO diagram, there may be some electronic uh, level that has electrons in it to an unoccupied orbital, so the next one up. So we call this a HOMO, highest occupied molecular orbital, to LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital transition. Transition. Okay, so this blue line here, this long line moving from what we call a ground state to an electronic state, is uh, essentially what we are studying in UV vis spectroscopy. We are studying the whole shift of electrons from one part of the molecule to, to another. And as we can see, because now the molecule has changed, this is a different potential energy curve at a different energy. So UV this spectroscopy will study these transitions. Similarly, in infrared spectroscopy, we don't see movement of electrons from one part of the molecule to another. We don't see these electronic transitions, but we do see the molecules um, vibrating more. So that means that the distribution of electrons must be populated across a wider range of vibrational levels. So these are called vibrational transitions. So we'll see, for example, the vibrational transition from one um, energy level to another. And I just realized, sorry, I described these energy levels here as molecular orbital energy levels. But of course, this is one molecular orbital energy level you'd have in an MI diagram. This is another one. So these, these lines here are obviously vibrational energy levels. And then within those vibrational energy levels, we have a series of rotational energy levels. So this is where we can provide the sample, for example, with microwave radiation, and it will provide enough energy just to rotate faster and faster and faster. So these transitions of interest are, are summarized. So for any transition, the energy will be the amount of energy that's um, transferred, uh, that's required, for example, to go from one electronic state to another, which we define described using what are called term values. These basically mean the amount of energy needed. So any transition might involve some electronic transition, plus some vibrational transition, plus some rotational transition. So we see here the E for electronic, V for vib vibrational, and J is a term we use in rotational spectroscopy. So in this course, we are going to look at rotational spectroscopy, vibrational spectroscopy, and electronic spectroscopy, so that we will be able to uh, describe, quantify, and utilize all of these different types of energies. An important point to note here is that we can describe energy in joules, the SI unit, or in wave numbers using CM to the minus 1. So here you see I have the energy in joules divided by HC gives me the energy in wave numbers. So in this course, wherever I use the symbol the Greek letter epsilon, that means the energy I'm describing is in wave numbers. And we almost always use that in spectroscopy. Wherever I use the symbol capital E, the energy will be in joules. All right, and we have to use that on certain occasions, um, but normally we use um, energy in wave numbers. OK, so as I mentioned, there was a sort of a short pre-lecture uh, catch catching up on all the kind of major points that we need to feed into this course. So if you haven't had a chance, I would recommend that you go over that. But really, in this first lecture, what I want to do now is um, focus on the first of our three spectroscopies, which is um, uh, microwave spectroscopy or rotational spectroscopy. So we, we mentioned in the pre-lecture that the uh, microwaves are pretty low energy uh, radiation. So they fall beyond infrared the infrared radiation in the electromagnetic state spectrum. And microwaves tend to provide enough energy to rotate um, molecules. And one thing I want to pause here on is, how does this actually happen? What is happening when light interacts with matter? And when light interacts with matter, what we tend to see is a um, movement or an interaction of some form that depends on change in dipole moment. So if we look here, our, our um, electromagnetic radiation will have light in three dimensions. So it could be on the x-plane, the y-plane, and the z-plane. 
So here we're just showing plane, the plane polarized light. So for example, along the um, XY plane, this, this, this peak here, we, our electromagnetic radiation is uh, going along this wavelength here. And if we look at, for example, our rotation, so if we have HCl, and our HCl molecule here will have a dipole. All right, so here our HCl is pointing, so the dipole is pointing directly upwards. And the molecule rotates, so it rotates around, so here it's rotating around anti-clockwise. So here the dipole is pointing directly to the left. It keeps rotating around, it will be pointing directly down, and then rotates around a bit more, it will be rotating pointing to the right, and so on. So this, this dipole will be continuously changing around. So if I draw a graph just looking at the dipole pointing directly upwards, what will that graph look like? Well, obviously, at the point where it's pointing directly upwards, that will be the height of the dipole interaction. If it's pointing either left or right, well, then there will be no uh, vector pointing up, so it will be zero. And if it's pointing directly down, well, it will be the most negative um, uh, value. So we see that as this molecule rotates, we are, we are generating a wave. And light will interact with uh, molecules once the wavelengths of the two interactions are the same. So um, what you may have come across before, the transition dipole moment, there's an operator there that is mapping on the rotation of the molecule with the wavelength of light. And that transition dipole moment is saying, well, how is the wavelength comparing to each other? So once this wavelength here ma matches the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation, but well then we talk about the molecule absorbing that light. This is how light interacts with matter. For vibrations, again, so the uh, uh, vibrations will lead to temporary change in dipoles, and again, we can map that, uh, that dipole change as a, as, a, as a wave, and again, once that wave in, uh, is of the same wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation, in this case, infrared radiation, well, then the molecule will absorb, absorb the light. Okay, so I opened this lecture with a typical classical uh, rotation spectrum. What we want to look at here is what we are seeing. Okay, so here we're seeing lots and lots of lines in our spectrum. And we're seeing the picture shape. Uh, we're seeing the fact that all the lines are equally spaced and so on. So what I want to do in this, in this lecture really is talk about um, rotation and how rotation leads to these kinds of spectra. So if we look at rotations, okay, so remember we mentioned that in vibrations. Well, vibrations, you are familiar with infrared spectroscopy and knowing about the carbon-oxygen bond vibration and so on, about 1,700 wave numbers. That's because vibrations lead to change in bond dipoles, whereas rotation is the whole molecule. Okay, the dipole is changing because the whole molecule is rotating. So rotation and rotational spectroscopy differs from vibrational spectroscopy because it's a whole molecule spectroscopy. So in other words, once we have more than one atom in there, it's not going to tell us information about specific parts of it, only about the whole molecule. Now, there are clever things we can do with isotopic substitution and so on, which you'll probably see next year. But for our purposes, rotational spectroscopy is, as you'll see, very powerful, but also quite limited because it's just telling us about the whole molecule. So that's why we tend to use it with uh, very simple, very simple molecules. So we're going to use rotation spectroscopy really as a way of explaining <coughs> uh, how we think about energy levels and energy transitions in spectroscopy. So rotation spectroscopy is a whole molecule spectroscopy. It's typically in the gas phase. Obviously, we want to be able to see um, um, molecules rotate. They need to be able to be free to rotate, so that tends to only happen in the gas phase. But it's a very, very sensitive technique, so therefore only tiny amounts of uh, molecules need to be in the gas phase uh, for us to detect them. So that's why, for example, it's a classic technique used in uh, astrospectroscopy, in other words, studying um, um, molecules in the solar system um, for identification purposes. This idea of regular space lines should make you jump up and scream out quantized energy. Okay, so we should have this sense that this means that we are moving from uh, individual energy levels of discrete amounts. So that's telling us our quantization. You're probably used to infrared spectroscopy being from about 500 wave numbers to about 4,000 wave numbers. Here you see it's much less. 
is found about 10 to 100 wave numbers. So this is telling us again the much lower amounts of energy, the much longer wavelengths that are involved in rotation. And you can probably even imagine that. Imagine a molecule rotating around. That's going to be much slower than a molecule vibrating. Um, so you can imagine the wavelength is much shorter. Now, in spectroscopy, we use things called selection rules. And this is essentially a way of saying, how do we know whether or not a transition is allowed or forbidden? Now, in the notes that accompany this, I've given a little bit more detail on this. But really, the core message here is we are able to say, um, when we look at transitions um, and look at their symmetry and exp exp look at the quantum um, the wave function associated with that, we're able to say, well, is this allowed from a quantum quantum chemical point of view? And this, this spits out um, uh, rules, what are called selection rules. And here, as I mentioned, a gross selection rule, in other words, an overall headline selection rule for rotational spectroscopy is that um, there must be a change in the uh, dipole. If there's no change in dipole, for, so for example, if I have nitrogen and two rotating, well, there'll be no change in dipole as that rotates, so therefore we're not going to see a rotational spectrum. Okay, so we need to begin to start to quantify now what we mean by rotation. So here we may have some diatomic molecule, and if we reconfigure that diatomic molecule using what's called a reduced mass, but then we can think about one one unit moving around a circle. And this is just much easier mathematically to to um, to use in our in our consideration because now we're talking about a, a radius here, which is effectively the bond length um, of, of the molecule, but it only relies on one mass term rather than on two. So this reduced mass idea, where we combine the masses. Okay, so here you see this mu symbol is the reduced mass. This is the product of the, of the masses divided by the sum of the masses. Okay, if you can't remember which is which, reduced mass is a mass, so therefore it has kilograms units or grams units. So therefore the units must fit out to be a, a mass unit here. So the product divided by the sum will leave us with units, for example, kilograms. And the extent of this um, rotation um, we want to think about we're moving atoms through space. What's that, what does that mean energetically? That can be quantified using the moment of inertia. If we're moving this atom uh, through space, well, it's going to take a certain amount of energy to move it. And the extent of that is the, the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia tells us, well, how heavy of an object are we moving through? How, how long is the radius that we're moving it through? So obviously, the longer that is, the uh, higher the moment of inertia. All right, so let's just tease that out with some with some um, examples. And this first example, we're asking um, to calculate the moment of inertia if we know the uh, bond length of CO2. So if you might want to pause the video here and try it yourself, but I'm just going to switch to the document camera. So once you press play again, we can go through the go through the answers. Okay, so we have CO. And what's happening here is our CO is rotating. So we are moving oxygen through space and carbon through space. So we want to get some sense of the moment of inertia. Well, that's the moment of inertia, I, is equal to the reduced mass multiplied by the band radius squared where mu is equal to m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2. So first of all, we need to calculate the reduced mass. Right, well, so we know that the mass of 12 carbon is equal to, uh, well, let's put it into uh, kilograms. So that'll be 12 by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per mole. Why? Because we're going to come out with SI units at the end of all this, so we need to be in kilograms. Uh, and to get rid of the per mole, we'll divide by Avogadro, 6.022 by 10 to the power of 23 per mole. That gives me 1.9, 1.993 by 10 to the minus 26 
kilograms. So a good check is we tend to get 10 to the minus 26, 10 to the minus 27 um, uh, kilograms when we're talking about atomic masses. Let's look at that again. We can do the same for oxygen. Oxygen will be equal to 16. 15.995, taking the actual uh, correct mass, multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per mole, divided by Avogadro, and that gives me 2.657 by 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And again, a check here is minus 26. So now we know our mass is in um, kilograms, so we can just stick those into the reduced mass formula. So it's 1.993 times uh, 2.657 over the sum. Uh, so we'll have kilograms squared upstairs, kilograms downstairs. That gives me a reduced mass of 1.1392 by 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. All right. So you can see it's a bit laborious, but very, very straightforward. Um, to work that out. So now if we go back to our i is equal to mu squared. That means we hold the bond length 113 uh, nanometers, so I is equal to 1.1392 by 10 to the minus 26 kilograms multiplied by 0.113 by 10 to the minus 9 meters. All squared so that's equal to 1.454 by 10 to the minus 46 kilogram meters squared. Okay. And again, we typically see values of 10 to the minus 46, 10 to the minus 47 in SI units. Right. What does that mean? That's telling us. Um, how much it is taking to move a mass through a particular uh, area. So it's giving us a sense of um, the effort involved, effectively, in rotating, in rotating this molecule. And that will obviously depend on uh, the bond length. OK, so the bond length is um, 0.113, but well then we can calculate the moment of inertia. Obviously, if we, can if we have the moment of inertia, we can calculate the bond length. And again, here you see the moment of inertia, 10 to the minus 47 kilograms per meter squared. Just keep those numbers in your head as kind of sensible values for these. Um, so obviously, we can do the reverse. And I won't go through it here. There's a YouTube answer that will that'll do that. Um, but I think when you work it out, you get a moment of inertia of um, 2.7. 639. So obviously, as we are lengthening the value of OR, well, because I is equal to mu OR squared, the longer we make OR, the uh, larger the moment of inertia becomes. All right. So let's move on a little bit now. So we want, to, we want to take what we're thinking about and put it into quantum terms. And um, the um, the, the way to think about this is we need to think about um, how does rotation, what's happening in the molecule when we rotate it. And if I have a molecule, so here I'm holding a pen, and I rotate it, I can rotate it in the plane of the board, so I'm rotating it so that it's um, staying in the plane of the board, or I can rotate it so that it's perpendicular to the board, rotating towards the camera or I can rotate it so that it is uh, uh, 
in the plane of the floor, because there's obviously three dimensions, three axes, on which we can um, uh, rotate it. The reason we choose um, diatomic um, molecules is that it simplifies the uh, simplifies it so that if I have diatomic, that means ro rotation around the axis, in other words, around the length of the bond, isn't actually moving molecules through space. So we have what's called zero angular momentum around the line. All right? So I'll just say that again. If we have, for example, you just take a, a tube. If you rotate that tube so that it rotates end to end, well, obviously you are moving um, mass through space. There will be a moment of inertia. But if you rotate that tube just around the axis of the tube, well, then we're not moving mass through space. So therefore, there is no um, moment of inertia. So the energy will be determined by the angular momentum along the other two axes, okay, around the axis where we are moving the mass through space. So, for example, around the plane of the floor and around the plane of the gourd. And because this has a very similar arrangement to the Schrodinger equation, and you've used that to derive, for example, um, sp and d orbitals, we end up with a very similar type of expression for um, rotation at energy levels. So here the uh, energy of rotation in joules is given by this expression where we have some some um, quantity, and you see moment of inertia appears in here, upon the rotational energy level times rotational energy level plus one. This is essentially if you um, uh, think about the transitions that we're interested in is from one rotational energy level to another. So we, we end up with this expression. And <coughs> We normally use, as I mentioned, wave numbers. So that means I can divide this across by hc. So now we get the energy of our rotational state is equal to the energy in joules divided by hc. That means I got rid of the one of the h's and the h squared, and I end up with c downstairs here. And this this value here, h over h pi squared ci, is usually just summarized as b, the rotational constant. Okay, sometimes written b v depending on the rotational constant. Uh, vibration level we're in, um, uh, but here we'll just write it as B. This is the equation underpinning rotational spectroscopy. Okay? The energy of a rotational state will be equal to the rotational constant, itself deriving from the moment of inertia, times the rotational state, times rotational state at the next uh, value up. And this is all a bit abstract, so what I'd like to do is to show you what does this mean in terms of um, let me just get my uh, sticker back. What does this mean in terms of actual um, the molecule rotating? The chem tube 3D is uh, a great source. So here we've got uh, in structure and bonding, structure and bonding, spectroscopy, rotational examples. And somewhere there. All right. So here we have various values of J. All right. J is equal to zero. J is equal to one, and so on. And you can see here um, we've got our energy dJ upon J plus one. So what this means is if I have a J, my molecule is in the J is equal to 1 energy level, it's rotating a bit. If I have it in the J is equal to 2 energy level, it's rotating a little bit more, and so on. Energy 3, more. So all these all these different J values mean uh, is the molecule is rotating a bit faster. And what we talk about then when we talk about the rotation transition is that we the molecule was here, and we gave it enough energy so that it could go from 1 to 2. It just rotates a little bit more. All right? And sometimes it's important to remember that because you can get lost in lots of equations. But really, when we talk about a spectroscopic transition, we just mean the molecule goes from one particular state to another. And in uh, rotational terms, that just means it's rotating a little bit more. But the key thing is is that these are discrete. These are defined. It's not going to get a little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster, you know, and so on. It's going to go from one rotational speed to another. 
it is quantized. So that means we see discrete transitions. Okay. So what I want to just tease out now is talking about energies and transitions. So again, there's a uh, YouTube video going over this, but I'll just go over some parts of it. So in this in this first part, we want to calculate the energies of the uh, j is equal to zero, j is equal to one, and j is equal to two levels. All right. So if we think about this, well, how are we going to do this? Well, if we look at the equation, we know we know that the um, I'll go back here. We're given the moment of inertia. We're given the moment of inertia, so that means we can use the moment of inertia to calculate the rotational constant. We can ignore this v here, and then we can use the rotational constant to calculate the energy. All right, so we want to say that um, uh, we know that B is equal to H over 8 pi squared C times I. So we need that that's equal to 6.636 by 10 to the minus 24 until seconds times 8 times 3, 1. Sorry, 8 times uh, 3.14 squared times 3 by 10 to the power of 10 centimeters per second. Okay, we use speed of light in centimeters per second times the moment of inertia, which we are told 1.454 by 10 to the minus 47 kilogram meters squared. And because a um, one joule is is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Well, the joule here will cancel the kilogram meter squared per second kilogram meter squared here, and the per second squared will cancel the second here upstairs and the per second downstairs. So we'll be left with units one over centimeter or wave number. All right, so that's why we like to use uh, speed of light in centimeters per second because it just spits out the wave number value. That gives me 1.92 wave numbers. So now, because the um, I'll go back here to all right. So we plug in a value, and we get uh, 1.92 wave numbers. Now, what we're interested in is calculating the energy of our rotational states, where we know the um, the E value. That's pretty straightforward now. The energy of the rotational state, Ej, is equal to dj upon j plus 1. Therefore, the energy of the zero rotational state will be equal to 1.92 upon 0 times uh, 0 plus 1 is equal to 0. In other words, a molecule in the zero rotational state isn't rotating. Now, that's the case for rotational spectroscopy, but as you will see, not for vibrational spectroscopy. So that, that ground energy level zero, so here we have um, J is equal to zero. The energy is zero. How about one? Well, we've got E1 is equal to 1.92 times one times two. So that's equal to 3.8. Four, one, four um, five numbers, so here j is equal to 1, is 3.84. How about 2? Well, we've got E2 is equal to 1.92 on 2 times 3. That's equal to 11.5 five numbers. And so on. So what we see is the gap between each rotational state is starting to increase. And when we work it out, we'll see it's actually increasing by an amount 2b each time. Why? Because we're adding on plus 1 all the time here. So we're increasing this by an amount 2b each time. 
that means our transition is getting longer each time by an amount t, 2b. So if we remember our spectrum, what we see here is we see the 0 to 1 transition here and here, to 1 to 2 transition, so 2b, 3.04, the 0 to 2 transition, sorry, the 1 to 2 transition, for what will that be? e2 minus e1, 11.85 minus 3.84, so that's equal to 7.69 wave numbers, so we'll see a peak for this transition of 4b, 7.69, and so on. So this is where we're getting the series of regular space lines, where the gap is always 2b between them. So the next one is going to be um, uh, 6b, and so on. Okay, so once we calculate these energies, Once we calculate the energies, we're able to see that the increase in energy increases by the same amount each time. So we go from J is equal to 0, no energy, J is equal to 1, an energy of 2B, J is equal to 2, an energy of 6B, and so on. That means the difference between of these, and the difference is the transition, which is what we are interested in in spectroscopy. Okay? The difference is the transition, which is what we are interested in in spectroscopy. So this difference increases by an amount to be each time. So when we look at our spectrum, what we're seeing is a series of regularly spaced lines, each to be more in energy than the previous one. You see that very clearly here in our series of transitions. When we, work, when we want to work out a transition, it's very easy. We just have to take the value from one energy level away from the next. So when we're asked what wave number does the J is equal to 1, J is equal to 2 transition appear, we just have to subtract uh, the lower value from the upper one. Okay, and that's this transition here. Uh, and then the last one, the trick question really, but just to highlight that a similar selection rule in rotational spectroscopy is that the value of J can only change by one in um, uh, rotational spectroscopy. So J is plus or minus one. And that's to do with essentially the fact that the molecule needs to rotate one full time before we're back to the start again, before we're back to thinking about the next uh, wavelength. Okay, so the selection rule here, delta J is plus or minus 1, means we only will see in our spectrum transitions that are due to uh, an increase of J or a decrease of J by 1. All right, so what this means then is, as I mentioned, that we're seeing, seeing this series of regularly spaced lines, each due to a transition that is getting longer by an amount to be each time. Okay, so here we see a value of 2b, value of 4b, value of 6b, and so on. So the differences between the energy levels are increasing by an amount 2b each time. And as we can see, those differences really depend on the moment of inertia. We're seeing very, very large values of b, um, 60 for hydrogen, very, very light molecule that's going to be able to spin very rapidly. And as we increase the... Um, mass of the, the uh, diatomic, in other words, so change in the moment of inertia, you see that the uh, decrease, so as we saw, is about 1.92, 1.93 for carbon monoxide. So, I'm going to point you now to a very common query that comes up through all of my years in teaching rotational spectroscopy, and that is the difference between the energy levels and the energies of transitions. Okay, so we have used quantum chemistry to come up with what these energy levels are. We have this determined that the energy level of a rotational state is Bj upon J plus 1. And we saw in that cartoon, we saw, uh, if I go back here, oops. that these energy levels correspond to the molecule rotating a certain amount. So I'm not rotating at all, energy level 0, to rotating a little bit, energy level 1, to rotating a little bit more, energy level 2, and so on. They are the energy levels. What we are interested in in spectroscopy are the differences between these levels. Okay? And we can see that these differences are getting larger and larger each time. So if I go back, and, oops, oh my. 
slide here. We can see that the energy levels are quantified by dJ upon J plus 1. But the differences between these energies are gained, as we saw on the last slide, just by taking one energy level away from the one next to it. So in other words, if we take energy level J plus 1 and subtract from that the energy level J, which we call the spectroscopic transition. Okay, this mu with the bar over it means it's the energy in wave numbers, which is a spectroscopic transition, which is equal to, well, we just, we just say it would be J plus 1 here for the first value, and J for the second, so it would be DJ upon DJ plus 1 upon J plus 2 minus DJ upon J plus 1. Okay, so this is the J plus 1 energy level. This is the J energy level. And we get this expression for a spectroscopic transition, which is 2B upon J plus 1. In other words, the transition will increase by an amount um, to the uh, difference between the transitions will be different by an amount to the each time. All right, now this is a very, very common query because students are uh, confusing the energy of the molecule described by this expression and the energy of the transition described by this expression. So just make sure you're clear on that in your head. The rotations that we see are the energies themselves. The spectroscopic transitions are the amount of energy we need to get from a slower rotation to a faster rotation. All right, so where does all this leave us? So we, so far now we have worked out the um, energy levels of rotational states. We've worked out the differences in those energy levels, and that difference relates on this relates to this uh, quantity we're calling the rotational constant. B, the rotational constant B connects us with the moment of inertia, which gives us information on bond lengths and on the masses of the atoms in the bond. In other words, the difference we are seeing in our spectrum, any difference here, so between these two peaks and between these two peaks, is 2b. So we can take that 2b value and we can relate it to the moment of inertia, and we can then use that to calculate, for example, bond lengths or bond um, molecule masses. So what we're seeing here is our transition 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 2 to 4, and so on. So these are all increasing by an amount 2b. Uh, so that means any difference here between these two um, between two peaks will give us this value 2b. So when you're interpreting a molecular rotational spectrum or a microwave spectrum, what you take from it are two peak values next to each other because delta j is plus or minus 1. And then that, value, that difference will give you the 2b value, which opens up lots of information about molecular structure. All right. The second characteristic of rotational spectra is that the line intensity increases. All right, so we see here it's quite low, and then it's getting higher and higher and higher, and then starts to decrease again. So it rises up to a maximum, and then falls off again. And this uh, transition intensity must relate to the population of energy levels. Okay, in other words, we will not see a transition from an energy level if no molecules are in that state, if no molecules are in that energy level. So we can't go from a molecule rotating, for example, in the J is equal to four, 3 to the J is equal to 4, if no molecules are in the J is equal to 3 state. So the population of energy levels is directly proportional to the transition probability that comes from them. So the spectral line intensity will depend on the population of the energy level, in other words, how many molecules are actually in that state, how many molecules are rotating at that particular speed, or rotating at a speed faster, or whatever. They'll all be different energy states. <clears throat> so obviously, the greater the number of molecules in a particular level, the higher the probability of transition, so therefore the more intense the signal. So we can say that molecules, that transitions will be more likely to come from this state, or more intense from this state, than they will be from this one, because more molecules are in this state. And we can get a sense of the relative populations of states using uh, the Boltzmann expression. 
And the Boltzmann expression essentially says that the, the, the relative population, in other words, how many molecules are in the upper state divided by how many molecules are in the lower state, will depend on several factors. The first thing is it will depend on the degeneracy of that state. So if we have an energy level, let's say we have, for example, an S orbital. And that S orbital has a particular energy level, and there's only one energy level at that energy. But if we think of a P orbital, well, a P orbital will have a particular energy, but there'll be three at that energy level. There are three degenerate P orbitals. So we can say the same more generally. The degeneracy of a particular state, in other words, the number of energy levels at that state, obviously means there's more opportunity for molecules to be in that state. So the relative population will depend on the generacy, the number of, energy, number of levels of the same energy. It will also depend on the energy difference in the temperature. For a molecule to move from one energy level to another, while well, the population at the higher energy level will depend on how hard it is to get there. So the larger that energy gap, the less likely a molecule will be in the upper state. If you think of our molecule rotating, if we wanted to rotate so fast, really fast, that it's very, very high energy, we're going to have to give it a lot of energy to, to occupy that state. So therefore, it's less likely the higher that energy level is. So this delta E value is quantifying how difficult is it energetically for that energy level upstairs to be populated in the first place. And KDT is giving us a sense of the uh, temperature contribution. In other words, the extent to which molecules uh, these higher energy states will be populated thermally. In other words, if we have um, thermal energy that a molecule will exist in, well then it's going to have to just distribute that energy across a range of energy levels, so it's more likely that the um, higher energy levels will be populated if they're thermally accessible. So this Boltzmann distribution effectively quantifies the relationship or the ratio between the population of the upper state and the population of the lower state. And that then gives us a way of uh, working out or thinking about um, peak intensity. So if we have, for example, electronic transitions, well, here, temperature isn't really a consideration. The gap is so large that these higher states are not going to be thermally occupied. We would have to give so much temperature, so much heat to raise the temperature of the system that the molecule would probably decompose before we were able to provide that uh, enough energy to reach a higher state. The thermal occupation is important when we think about vibrational and especially rotational states because the energy gap between them is very, very small. So it's very easy for the heat in a system to distribute across these energy levels. The second law of thermodynamics drives that forward. Energy will distribute as much as possible. So uh, um, populations of uh, vibrational and rotational energy will depend on temperature. <coughs> So what we, what we are seeing is uh, um, an increase in our, in our spectrum. And that's because of the first half of the Boltzmann expression. Rotational states are degenerate by 2g plus 1. In other words, sorry, 2j plus 1. In other words, uh, if j is equal to 1, the first um, energy level, but well, then it's triply degenerate, just like a p orbital is triply degenerate. If j is equal to 2, well, then 2j plus 1 is 5. So there are five energy levels, the gen general energy levels, for the j is equal to 2 level. So that means just like a d orbital, for example, has uh, five uh, um, degenerate levels. So that means, then, if there are more levels, there's more chance for those uh, levels to be populated at that same energy. So obviously, as we go from j is equal to um, 1 to j is equal to 2 to j is equal to 3, the degeneracy of each of those levels is increasing according to 2j plus 1. Therefore, the population of those levels are higher because there's more molecules in them at lots of the levels, so the intensity will be more um, as we increase. But obviously, this reaches a maximum. Okay, So we, we see a maximum here that if, if, if it's only degeneracy, well, then this peak would just keep increasing. Um, the intensity of the peak would increase as j increased. But it starts to level off. And it starts to level off because of the second reason in the second part of the Boltzmann expression, which is this comparison between the energy gap and the poss possibility of thermal occupation. So obviously, as this energy gap increases, 
the thermal population, in other words, just due to the temperature of the molecule, decreases um, because the molecule doesn't have enough energy as heat to populate those higher those higher um, energy levels. So uh, as the uh, rotational levels start to get larger, uh, the gap gets larger and larger away from the, the lowest level, well then the possibility of occupying those thermally starts to really decrease. So we see even though there are lots of degenerate levels, there are very few molecules in those states, so therefore the intensity of the peak or the probability of transition from those reduces. So this is just kind of an overview of, of why our rotational spectra that we see Yes, we understand the equal space lines, but now we can also understand why there's an increase in intensity and then a decrease in intensity, giving these beautiful um, symmetric spectra. Okay, so I won't go through this exercise in detail, but the great value of this now is we can get a sense of relative populations at, at whatever temperature we like. All right, so here we can see the uh, energy gap. And this is one of the few occasions where we use energy in joules in spectroscopy, okay, because we need, we need SI units if we're going to use the Boltzmann constant. So here my energy gap is in joules. So we can uh, plug in our value for J is equal to 1, J is equal to 0. Well, because it's the degeneracy of J is equal to 1 is 2J plus 1, so it'll be um, 3 divided by 1. So N1 over N0 will be 3 over 1 times this exponential where we plug in our delta E value, uh, and we can see that the Boltzmann um, contribution here is tiny because we're coming out of the value pretty much relating to the generator. So the N1 over N0 value population um, is about uh, 3 is to 1. So that's why the peak that we see in, um, uh, not coming out quite as well as we'd hope here, but this peak here in principle should be three times the intensity uh, of this peak here. All right, um, and we, we can we can go on. But the advantage, I'm not going to go into it in this course, but you pick it up next year, is that we can turn this around and we can say, well, we know what the relative populations of two states would be at a particular temperature. So if we look at the relative intensities of peaks, we can find out the temperature of the source. And this is a really good way of studying uh, temperatures. Uh, so we can actually use rotational spectroscopy to find our temperatures. And this is a common example of for example, interstellar um, uh, spectroscopy, where we can actually estimate the temperatures of the molecules at the source that we're looking at. So, very useful expression. <coughs> so, to give you a sense of how that might happen, the um, obviously the larger the value of uh, delta E, which in itself is uh, related to B. Um, the more impact it's going to have on the spectrum. Because remember, B will tell us about the gap between two energy states. So the larger B is, the um, bigger that gap is. The bigger that gap is, the quicker we move, we get to this Boltzmann restriction of thermal occupation of states. So you can see when B is much larger, the uh, spectral intensity starts to decrease much more quickly than when B is smaller. Okay. So as we make that gap harder and harder to jump thermally, well, then the thermal um, um, cutoff fits in earlier. So that's why some, that's why the energy gap here will, will give us a sense of um, the spectrum. And we can use that. We can use that almost visually when we look at spectra to, to get, a, get a sense of the relative extent or size of uh, the rotational constant E. Okay, so um, this also allows us to determine what the maximum occupied state will be, what level should we see the most intense peak coming from, all right? And that, that, will, that will be essentially what the highest peak is in our spectrum. But if we model the spectrum, just like I have in this curve, in, in this um, curve uh, uh, by, by using this expression, well then, the point at which the slope is zero in this curve will <coughs> equate to the inflection point here in our in our Spectrum. In other words, the point at which it levels off and starts to decrease again. So if we can essentially get the derivative of this expression uh, and set that derivative is equal to zero, well then we can work out the J value which has the max maximum um, uh, population, the highest occupied um, population, or where we will see the most intense peak. So chemical physics or anybody 
mathematically inclined if you want to have a go at deriving that, it's a little bit of quite easy, a little bit of fun. Um, but essentially what we can see here is that this J max value will obviously depend on the temperature of the system. In other words, how easily that uh, higher energy state is reached and the um, ro rotational constant. In other words, the, the extent of the gap between um, energy states. Okay, so that's a pretty good place to stop this course. So if I just go back to our spectrum, what I'm trying to get across is First of all, we can use rotational spectroscopy as a really good model for explaining energy levels and transitions between energy levels. Okay, so we're teasing out here things like um, thinking about uh, spectral transitions and working out energy differences, things like um, talking about uh, the generacy and, and population intensity. So obviously, the more populated an energy state is, the more likely you will see a transition from that energy state. And also starting to tease out particular issues associated with shape of spectra. And then we can use spectra, spectroscopically, to think about, well, here I can derive the rotational constant B, because the gap between these two peaks would be 2B. That gives me moment of inertia, which gives me bond length and so on. Or, because the shape of the spectrum is related to temperature, I can use that to uh, get some information about the temperature of the sample. Just to give you a kind of a preview as to where this goes next. So I mentioned that rotation spectroscopy is a whole molecule spectroscopy. And that can be a bit of a nuisance when you want to know some information about some individual component. Normally, we turn to vibration spectroscopy, but there are clever ways of using isotopic substitution. Because with isotopic substitution, the bond length doesn't change, but obviously the reduced mass will. So if you think about our moment of inertia equation, the moment of inertia will, will change due to bond, um, bond uh, sorry, due to reduced mass, but not due to bond length. And that allows us to work out um, different rotational constants due to isotopic substitution, which means we can probe the molecule in different ways. So that's, that's picked up, I think, next year. One major assumption we've had in our course this year is that we've assumed that our molecule is rigid as it rotates. That bond is basically a piece of plastic joining together the two atoms at the end. So as it rotates faster and faster and faster, nothing happens to that. But of course, in reality, that bond is essentially uh, overlapping atomic orbitals, holding together the two molecules. And as it rotates faster and faster and faster, the bond will actually start to uh, vibrate. So as the molecule is rotating faster and faster, the bond vibrates. And obviously, as it vibrates, the average length of the bond is going to start increasing. If the length of the bond increases, then that affects our rotational constant, B. So we need to account for what's called distortion due to rotation. But that actually also gives us lots of really useful information about the molecule. In other words, because that relates to vibration, we're able to get some vibrational information. And then, of course, you know, life is not just diatomic molecules. So there's a, there's a question of how do we take this forward of the polyatomic molecules. In theory, it's very difficult. There's a lot of maths behind it. But actually, in, in practice, it works out very straightforward for a whole cohort of types of molecules. So you'll see some useful tricks um, for that in chemistry tree next year. All right, so the tutorial questions really will pick up on lots of aspects of using rotational spectra and how we can find information from rotational spectra that will give us uh, uh, insight into molecular structure. So good luck with those.